Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to N5D Radio's Cosmic Awakening Show, where we are serving this galaxy and beyond. My name is Michelle Walling, and I'll be your host for the next few hours. And tonight, I'd like to bring on my fabulous co-host for this show, Mr. Craig Prescott. Hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, goodness. I could hear you because we're in the same room broadcasting from our uh, N5D headquarters here in Sarasota, Florida. And it's really great to be back in the 70-degree weather after our week-long trip to New York. And uh, while we were there, um, I had a wonderful reading with uh, Cindy Staffen. Uh, Cindy has been on the Cosmic Awakening show before, and she's um, a really very gifted psychic. Um, be sure to check Cindy out because she does phone readings and her website is EssentialAwakenings.com and her rates are really reasonable and she's one of the N5D approved resources that we can share with you for those who are looking for some kind of uh, direction or timeline answers um, from possible um, timelines and realities. And also, um, while we were in New York, we got to hang out with Kathy Cernak and her son, Alex Thompson, at the wonderful Magnolia, a gathering place, which is Kathy's new place. Um, And we had a great time. Kathy's an old friend of yours, Greg. And um, we saw that uh, we got to spend a little time with Alex. And his uh, generation has a really good understanding of who they are and why they are here. And so um, it's going to be exciting. I'm going to be bringing on Alex uh, to the show in the near future in order to share information about the Indigo's uh, crystals, rainbows, and starseed children and what they have to offer to our audience. And a special shout-out tonight to a new friend that we met at the Magnolia, and that's Tamara Kiss. Hi, Tamara. And it was a pleasure uh, to meet Tamara, and um, I think this might be the first time she's listening to our show tonight, so hello. I also want to take this opportunity to say hello to Jamie from Unidella, New York, who was shopping at Cindy Saffin's shop while we were there, and she just happened to be an N5D reader. So, um, Jamie, I told you I was going to mention you on the air, so hello to you. You never know who you're going to run into and when you get out and, and just, you know, it's very rarely, Greg, that we leave our home base. Um, and finally, also from Greg's hometown, hello to Marilyn Roper. Marilyn, um, Tom got the best of us while we were in Oneonta and uh, feel awful that we didn't get to meet up, but just wanted to let you know on air that we're thinking of you. And we'll be back up when the weather warms up. It's uh, a little too cold right now to even think about going back to New York, right, Greg? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I know at the airport, airport, before we left uh, to fly back to Florida, I built a little snowman and posted it on my uh, Facebook page. Yeah. (laughs) It's so (laughs) wonderful here. Um, So, Greg, thank you for joining me on this show with filmmaker, author, and alchemist Jay Widener. Um, I know that you're very interested in what Jay has to say tonight, and I am very excited to have him on the show. He's one of my very favorites. And this will be um, a very informative show about a variety of topics that we have addressed on N5D, but this is our first experience with Jay. We'll be bringing him on in just a few minutes, uh, but first I'd like to give you some recognition and gratitude for all of your hard work over the years to provide this platform as you are our radio show sponsor at Cosmic Awakening Show with N5D Radio that makes this show possible. And I was wondering, Greg, for those who may not have, um, they're just tuning in to the Cosmic Awakening Show, if you could tell our listeners 
um, about your websites and um, how how things are going with the websites at this time, what's going on. Well, actually, just to backtrack a little on how it actually all got started, I basically received what what I call a galactic download in 2008 where I asked the universe for ideas and directions and was guided to build a website to prove that the 2012 hysteria was not the end of the world. The following year, I was guided to build In5D.com and was even given the name by Universe In5D. Now, keep in mind that I knew nothing about building a website and built these websites from scratch using Dreamweaver. Uh, right now, my main websites are In5D.com and BodyMindSoulSpirit.com. And between both websites, we're reaching almost 3 million people a month as they're both in the top one half of 1% of all websites on the Internet. As you know, Michelle, I work between 12 to 15 hours every day, 365 days a year. haven't had a day off since 2008, so I guess that shows the passion I have for doing what I do. Now, BodyMindFullSpirit.com is more of a science-based website that everyone can relate to, but if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, then you'll love in 5D. Um, and many of you, as many of you already know, Michelle is one of our many writers on N5D, and I look forward to her articles and radio shows as much as she looks forward to mine. Oh, well, I'm really happy to bring you back on air um, since you're on this permanent vacation from your own show, and I can understand why. I mean, yeah, this guy over here does work a lot. So, but I'm really glad to have your voice back on the radio and I know that our listeners are excited to hear uh to hear you. And so, um because of that, I'm going to pretty much let you run the show tonight. And so, I think it's a good time now to bring on our guest. Um Jay Widener is a renowned author, filmmaker, and hermetic scholar. He's considered to be a modern-day Indiana Jones for his ongoing worldwide quests to find clues to mankind's spiritual destiny via ancient societies and artifacts. And his body of work offers great insight into the circumstances that have led to the current global crisis. He is the director of powerful and insightful documentaries, uh, Kubrick's, Kubrick's Odyssey, Infinity, The Ultimate Trip, and his most recent future film is called The Last Avatar, he is also the producer of the popular documentary films 2012 The Odyssey and its sequel Time Wave 2013. Jay was featured in the History Channel's documentary The Lost Book of Nostradamus and was associate producer and featured in the History Channel special Nostradamus 2012 and also in Brad Meltzer's Decoded. He participated in Jesse Ventura's conspiracy theory, and I'll get that a uh, thing out of my mouth here in just a second for True TV. <laughs> <laughs> I love talking, but I don't like reading. In addition, he's the co-author of The Mysteries of the Great Cross of Hende, The Alchemy and the End of Time from Destiny Books and A Monument to the End of Time with Vincent Bridges, as well as a contributing writer for the book The Mystery of 2012 from Sounds True. Um, but to get more information on Jay's background, you can visit his website, which is jwidener.com, and that's J-A-Y-W-E-I-D-N-E-R.com. And you can also visit his other website called sacredmysteries.com, and that's how you can get a little bit more background info on Jay. He's he's very well known, and so we're not going to spend a lot of time on introducing um, his background, but we're going to get right into it because he doesn't have a lot of time to spend with us tonight. And so with that introduction, Jay Widener, welcome to the Cosmic Awakening Show. Hey, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> thanks for being here. We're so excited to have you. Thanks yeah. for being here, Jay. I'm a huge fan of yours. Well, that's good to hear, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> you know, I... <laughs> Well, Jay, I would like to kick off the show with a little news about your recent screenings, I believe, that I heard about on the film The Last Avatar that you that you did with Sharon Rose. And then I'm going to turn it over to Greg to dive into some topics that um, he and I would like your opinion on. And um, so this movie that you've, that you've created here, um, 
the last Avatar, it's been a few years in the making. I was wondering, can you tell our audience about the premise of the film and uh, how you're using it as a tool of awakening through creative, the creative art of filmmaking? Well, uh, it, it actually began with a, a series of conversations, actually, that I had in 2010, early 2010, with the, uh, I guess you would call him artist, anthropologist, and writer Robert Lawler, who's written extensively about the uh, the Aborigines in Australia and their highly spiritual culture. And we were talking about how the Aborigines were in looked so much similar to the the southern uh people that lived in southern India and uh, how there must have been some kind of mass migration at one time of uh of the people either from southern India to Australia or from Australia to southern India and in fact you could actually walk uh, during during the last ice age you could walk actually, from Australia to southern India, or at least use a canoe uh, because of the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, water levels had lowered and, and it was a lot easier to get across. So um, anyway, uh, it, it, this all led to this idea of Lemuria <clears throat> and how there was once a land that existed around the entire Pacific Ocean which was, uh, you know, a, a, a culture. And uh, I just became extremely fascinated by it. And to hear this guy who was, I considered to be, you know, he'd written people, Voices of the First Day and uh, Sacred Geometry. And he was really, you know, one of the highest, elitist, most uh, minds uh, esoterically uh, uh, around. And to have him, like, entertaining such uh, ideas as this, uh, really fascinated me. So I began looking really into it and finding that there's a lot of evidence that there was indeed before the catastrophe that happened 13,000 years ago when the comet hit, uh, there was this culture that was around the rim of the Pacific and it was a boat-faring culture and uh, it was called Lemuria, or at least we can call it Lemuria. We don't really know what they called it, but the evidence for the culture clearly exists. And I was living on the west coast of the United States at the time in uh, southern Oregon, which was part of this place, uh, according to the myths, and I was about mm, 90 miles north of Mount Shasta, and I became, and I realized that Mount Shasta was part of this whole Lemurian myth, mythology. And so I got into reading books about Mount Shasta, and I realized there's this incredibly weird series of stories and myths and ideas, uh, all of going back and you know when the white man came to Mount Shasta, uh, and and to the Indians that lived here when white man came. Uh, their stories were filled with stories of uh, luminous beings and uh, creatures of uh, humans who were really tall with red hair and white skin who had come out of the caves. And it was, like, astonishing. And, and, and uh, a Dweller on Two Planets uh, was written by a guy who lived just on the base of Mount Shasta uh, about, you know, uh, uh, Philo the Tibetan who uh, traveled underground from Tibet to Mount Shasta to tell him the story, you know. And it just felt, it was just like, wow, what's going on here? Anyway, so it, eventually, you know, our conversations reached this point of that Indian culture, the culture from India, was a, a a remembrance of this great Lumerian culture that had been destroyed by the comets. And that in this story of India and, and their beliefs was a story of avatars. And that there were ten avatars that would come to Earth uh, through the course of the next, you know, epoch, epoch, uh, not not the coming epoch, but the entire epoch, there was ten, but in the coming epoch, there would only be one more coming. Uh, no, there would be three more coming. There would be Krishna, and then Buddha, 
And then there was one more coming, which was Kalki. And Kalki was the one that finishes the whole thing off and ends the age and brings in kind of the age of light. And I, I'd been following this story for years and years and years. I never connected to Lemuria. And so I began constructing this screenplay that connected Lemuria with uh, Kalki, with the Illuminati and my favorite subjects, and uh, eventually created this movie that was you know, based kind of about the awakening, but also connected these ancient cultures and uh, these uh, very esoteric ideas into what I was hoping would be a cohesive whole. I know that's a long answer to a short uh, question, but uh, anyway, the whole upshot is is that at the end of at the end of this age, it is prophesied in the uh, Vedic text that the last avatar will come, and he will destroy the liars uh, and uh, the purveyors of lies. And uh, I was waiting and waiting for uh, about uh, 25 years, and he never came, so I decided to make a movie about it. <laughs> well, I think it's a great way to get the message out about you know our about how you feel about how we're going to basically be lifted out of this dense place that we're in. And I understand that you had some uh, some recent screenings on the film, and um, how did that go? Really, really well. Ninety-five percent positive. Um, uh, the second weekend, which was really the important weekend to watch metrically, is um, we got um, like four times the amount of people who said they came here from word of mouth. And really, today the only thing that works with movies and theater and rock and roll or, is uh, word of mouth. You know, people telling each other mm-hmm. on Facebook and whatever, "Hey, go see this movie. It's really rocking." And, and and that's what happened, and that's what we were looking for. So we were really happy, but they loved the movie, and they clapped and laughed at all the right places, and they got the message that, you know, we are all beings of light and that there's really nothing to fear and that, you know, the people that are on top right now are selling fear as a business model and that we've got to not listen to what they're saying and, and that's that's you know what I, the only thing I need to get out. I tried to do it in a way that you know was um, palatable to people who um, like the way that regular Hollywood movies look. So I tried to make it, and I did make it you know extremely professional. And, and, and I spent a lot of money, and I uh, you know I didn't what I did was I I I created my companies um, with my wife Sharon Rose uh, Sacred Mysteries. Uh, both the distribution company and the production company with the sole purpose of of actually making a film like this. And so what we did was just, you know, for years we sold our DVDs on, you know, our documentaries and our instructionals, and then we kind of just cashed in all the money that we made and put it into the movie. Uh, You know, not really hoping to make money, but the whole point is to change consciousness because once consciousness is changed, then money doesn't matter. So... You know, it becomes a kind of a deal like that, which is hard for straight people to understand. But uh, you know, my family and my friends are going, "Oh my God, you're insane! You're taking all your money, and you're you know, you just keep regurgitating it. You never put it in savings." And and I don't, and I don't even believe in savings, and I don't believe in insurance, and and so it's like you know, I'm I'm surfer at the edge of time, and. And just spending all my money trying to kick it back into this movie, and and it's just really gratifying to hear that you know people thought that it they got it. And there's no doubt they got it. And there was people crying at the end, and they realized that you know and they got it. That's all I can say. Mm-hmm. And, and so it proves that we can create the kind of propaganda for our side that the other side's been creating for years. Well, it's interesting. I mean, at this point, we could just end the show because you've pretty much nailed everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, we don't we don't need we don't need money, and you know, we're going to be raising our consciousness, and we don't need to buy into the fear propaganda that that's been put out there. And so that's it. I mean, that's our that's our whole message. So that's anyway. my message. That's the message of the <laughs> film, and and you know, it's like the only message we should be repeating. You know, that's why you know I was on a 
uh, I was on a radio show recently where somebody was giving me grief, and you know, I, and about Sandy Hook because I decided to go out on the edge and and you know uh, really look into Sandy Hook, and you know they're saying you're losing all your credibility by looking at this, and I'm like. No, you know, we have to celebrate the fact that no one died at Sandy Hook and that, you know, this is a wonderful thing. We don't have anything to fear from it. And it just really gave them grief. And, and I don't know what to say, you know, the, the hooksters have got us in and they want to keep selling us grief and fear and horror and terror. And and um, I won't buy into it. Mm-hmm. So, so basically your movie is a movie of fiction based on facts. Yeah, that's exactly right, and that's a great, really good point. My wife likes to point out that perhaps the profiter or prophetess that saw, you know, looked into the future and saw the last avatar of Kalki coming to destroy the liars and the purveyors of uh, lies was, you know, I saw my movie instead of actually seeing the uh, the actual uh, event, and which is a very interesting and inverted, weird look at reality. You know, I, I'd be happy to help you promote your movie on N5D and BodyMindSoulSpirit.com, too. So maybe we can we'll talk afterwards. T- uh, we'll about take any you. help we can get. All right, sounds Trust great. Me. Yeah, we put a lot of money into this movie, and we just eat, our only goal right now is just to break even. Well, we've been listening to your material for quite some time now, and um, we resonate with. Um, you know, everything that, that you say. So we'd be happy to do that. And with that being said, um, Greg, I'd like to move on to some exciting topics. And I know you've got some questions for Jay. And if I have uh, something to add to the discussion, I'll just raise my hand over here and you can see me and I'll pop <laughs> in. But the, the floor okay. is yours. All right. Well, we're a week away from Christmas, so I'd like to jump in on that. The origins of Christmas predate Christianity through the pagan holiday called Saturnalia, which was a week long of lawlessness and debauchery from December 17th through December 25th that honored Saturn and included human sacrifice, intoxication, naked caroling, and rape. During these seven days, there were no punishments for breaking any laws according to Roman law. Uh, In the year 4 AD, Christianity adopted Saturnalia with hopes that they could convert the pagans into Christianity by promising that they could still celebrate Saturnalia as Christmas. What can you tell us about Saturnalia and the Saturn cult as to why it's so important for those who control society? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. It kind of brings me back, uh, remembering back to, um, to uh, the murder of uh, Joan Benet Ramsey on December 25th in 1996, and uh, which got me actually that was my first step into understanding this kind of cult that I did not understand, <clears throat> and why would they pick you know that date to do their deed, and um, I, I, and as I walked down or ran down or swam down that rabbit hole. Um, you know, it just became clearly obvious that, first off, you have to read the, and I'm going to forget this guy's name, the the author, but the book is named Fire and Ice, and you go to, all you have to do is go to Amazon, type in Fire and Ice and Saturn, and you'll get his name. And um, then the work of Richard Hoagland on Iapetus, which is a, um, a uh, satellite of Saturn, and then um, also the ring ma- ring makers of Saturn, which is another really good book. And um, there's a bunch of good books. So I, I mean, I just delved into the entire Saturn cult, and you know, and I came away realizing that <clears throat> there is a subcult of people which is extremely hidden, but is clearly there which is, uh, and they have many break-off groups, but they're all still united, even though they may be under different names, like Skull and Bones, or um, Anton LaVey's uh, Church of Satan, or the the Church of Set, or all these different um, uh, groups are all united by the fact that they uh, worship uh, Saturn. And Saturn is the god that was here before Zeus. 
So Saturn ate, uh, Saturn was warned that he would, you know, be usurped by one of his sons. And so he was the god of the world before Jehovah. Jehovah took over uh, Saturn. Saturn is is uh, is this god that lived, and then he had to go underground and 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 emerge as a uh, a cult, which uh, really really surfaced first in Babylon, and 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 then later in uh, Rome, and it's the cult of the serpent. And uh, uh, Saturn is, is is the serpent, and um, it, it, it and it exists. And in everywhere you look, the more you look, like Saturnalia was Roman. Uh, uh, you, you you look at how Moses, you know, turned the rod into a snake, and you can see that he was showing that he was part of the Saturn cult, and you can see why. You know the the worship date of the of the Jews is Saturday, which is Saturn Day, and uh, you can see that this cult of of the snake and the cult of Saturn are the same thing, and then you can see if you keep looking that it never went away, <laughs> and that it just continued through skull and bones and through various different cults today. And that these cults are all united by the same kind of goal, which is uh, hmm, a conquering of the spiritual nature of humans with an animal nature, uh, where they're trying to trying to emphasize the more animal nature of the dualistic nature of the human being, which is divided between the animal side and the spiritual side. And the Saturnalia, the Saturns, they're trying to drive us into the ground, into the earth, into a pure animal spirit of a no nothing above us, no no ethereal thoughts, no uh, higher level beings cutting us off from our higher selves into a kind of mm, orgiastic, uh, almost uh, orgiastic communist um, uh, commune of oneness, which they think is oneness. Uh, I'm getting really deep here. I can't believe it. And That's the, great. Uh, uh, and the opposite is this is to go into spirit, which they detest. And the spiritual people are losing at this point right now because there's no one who can articulate it, our argument well enough to get enough converts over to stop the Saturnalian forces from conquering so Lady Gaga and television and the movies and horror films these are all those forces trying to drive us down into into this leaden uh heavy experience like Frodo getting closer to Mount Doom and the ring getting heavier and heavier. We're like approaching Mount Doom and we're getting heavier and heavier. These are the Saturn forces, and 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 Tolkien knew all this, so there's not there's no uh, you know there's a definite link in that narrative because Tolkien knew about what I'm telling you, and he actually you can actually see that Sauron is um, Saturn. And complete with the eye, which actually, by the way, exists on the south pole of Saturn. Sauron's eye sits there. Just Google it and you'll see it. You know, it's fascinating fascinating that when we celebrate Christmas, we're still giving our energy away to Saturn. You know, yep. and, and I also find it interesting that when people exchange wedding rings, the rings represent the rings of Saturn. In astrotheology, Saturn is Satan, so you gotta wonder who you're really giving your energy to. Well that's exactly right. And you know, anything that binds you is a uh, um something that you really don't want to have. I don't have any rings, no bracelets, nothing. I, I won't have anything that binds me. Um because of what you just said. 
And yeah, that's the, if you look, the whole cult is built all around it, from crowns to rings to bracelets to anklets, and 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 if they're all these binding things. Think think about it. Think about you know how a chain is affixed to the human body, and it's affixed through a ring that goes around the ankle and the wrist. Um, and you know it's a slavery. It's just, we are the slaves. And I see women, you know, and I and I love women. I love beauty. But I see them walking down the street with you know with a bunch of bracelets on their wrist, and I'm like, hey, you know, what are you announcing? You're a slave or what? I mean, come on. And and that's how I feel about it, you know. And and, and so we have to find a way to first under identify and understand what this force is, and then why does it, you know, seek to enslave us? Yeah. Now there's there's talk about Saturn being the projector to the moon, which harvests negative energies projected from our planet. Have you heard anything along those lines? Oh, yeah, tons. The the the, er, the, the moon, there are so many myths connecting Saturn and the moon. And, and don't forget, that's how we we tell uh, time. Um, the, uh, um, the larger, uh, remember, because... Saturn is the, the out, most outer planet that we can see. It became the longest chronometer of our, our of our um, astro calendar uh, outside of the uh, precession of the equinox. I mean, so for you know the precession of the equinox, we could see if you were really advanced astro um, culture, then you would be able to see that there is a twenty six thousand year clock going up in the sky, but. Outside of that, your longest chronometer would be Saturn, you know, which is, you know, 29 plus years. So you would be able to mark a 29 plus cycle uh, with with Saturn if you're watching very carefully. But the, you know, but the next real cycle that would matter to you would be the cycle of the moon, which is the month, you know, the 30 day, 28 days, 27 day, whatever system you're looking at cycle mm-hmm. and so you know and then of course women you menstruate by the cycle and uh, there's many you know crime goes up when the full moon happens and we're governed by these cycles which are directly so so it's like a transformer saturn is the ultimate transformer of the outer edge of our time sphere uh, and a lot of this come from Jose Arguelles on my conversations with him, and then the moon is governing the inner cycle of this time sphere, where we're governed by this kind of weird o- oscillating twenty se- twenty seven day to late twenty eight day cycle, which happens you know every every month. I am moon, actually, and uh, uh, so this thing is is this incredible oscillation which causes the tides and and everything. So we're being physically affected by it. So the thing is, <clears throat> are we slaves to it? And that's that's the thing that you know is happening right now. We are becoming slaves to sequential time. Uh, when sequential time is not really true. Um, the Saturnalians, the Saturnians, the Brotherhood of Saturn, whatever you want to call them, they, want, they, have, in, they have ensconced our culture with linear time. That's when they entered into civilization 6,000 years ago, you know, the, after the catastrophe... Uh, you know, there was a brief period of time when we were just trying to get ourselves together and then suddenly emerge, and I'm not going to even speculate in where these people came from. I suspect I know where they came from. Uh, they, uh, a group of people came and they conquered Samaria and they became the conquerors of time. They created calendars. They created the work day. They created civilization. They created eight-hour days. They created, you know, hierarchies. They created, they took us out a a kind of ever-present moment, which the hunter-gatherer was in, to a time nightmare, a time-slave nightmare 
for which we are now facing a major world crisis because of that, because of that aberration, because we're no longer um, natural creatures anymore. We're now slaves of time and slaves of the masters of time. It's funny. You mentioned Jose Arguez. He studied Lord Pacal's tomb and said one of the most important things we need to learn is to live without time. Now, with Saturn being Kronos or Father Time, how do you explain the time speeding up phenomenon in correlation to living without time? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that I, what I think about that is that um, because we're beginning to win the war against time, um, that time is losing, and and that is happening. I mean, y- y- we are living in multiple times now. What, what's happening is that the internet has given us access to a kind of a an ever present moment, uh, where we're just in this ever present moment on the web. And it's it's this weird thing. I was sitting here tonight, you know. I had one of my laptop, uh, one of my uh, iPads was going. uh, 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 I was watching a a documentary on YouTube about Neanderthals. Uh, I was uh, emailing on my iPhone to people at work about what I thought they were doing on certain projects. And I had my big screen TV going, and I was watching something on TV. And it's like I was in this ever-present moment. And I realized, hmm, this is very odd. You know, I'm, I've got all these things going on, and I don't really care about anything but what I'm actually involved in. And <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, and, and and I think that's where we're headed. And and I think it's actually quite interesting. And we're going to. It's not going. It, politicians, I don't think, are going to matter pretty soon. I'm not sure they matter anymore at all. Anyway. <laughs> And I think we're we're just moving into this place where it's just like, oh yeah, well whatever, let's make some linguini, you know, and and I think that's where we're at, uh, 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 getting more and more detached from that world, and I think it's a good thing. I think we're getting, you know, and I don't think, I don't know, it's it, we're moving in such a surreal place right now that I've never, you know, we're in un- unproven ground. I agree. It's almost like coming. Full circle, you know, we went from being asleep to what was happening to realizing everything that was going on and then back to, well, can't do anything about it until we get people to raise their consciousness. So, you know, let's let's have fun, you know, let's just do things that we enjoy. So, but, you know, I have a a question from the chat room from Man for Peace. And uh, he says, um, I assume he's a man. (laughs) He says, hello, can you ask Mr. Widener about the spirit slash soul of our son uh, and what is this being or entity what do they have to say about Saturn the earth and our predicament here on earth but I'm not sure I quite understand uh, the question um, I but either. I would like that you I would like for you to um, to tell us a little bit about how you see the truth about the sun and what it does play, the role that it does play, um, because the sun, um, if it's if it's not a construct, then it has consciousness. But how do you see the sun and, and the role that it's playing right now? Well, you know, I think the sun is, I, I, I use the electric universe model of the sun. I believe the sun is a big, huge ball of plasma, with a uh, empty center, and uh, that when you look into a sunspot, you're looking into the black empty hole that's inside the sun, and uh, and so and I believe that you know that uh, uh, any time that electromagnetic energy goes into a globular global kind of structure, it attains intelligence. And uh, uh, and so I believe that, you know, I mean, if you really want to know what I believe, I believe the sun is the, it is the, it is a hole in space where light comes through and uh, impregnates matter. And that the earth, is being impregnated by the sun, which is a hole in sp- a hole in time and space, 
where intelligent energy is coming through. And that intelligent energy is called light and is permeating the earth and anything that accepts it. You have to have water, though. <laughs> That's the key. So if you have water and, and just a, a hard planet, and then you can have what we call, you know, conscious beings emerge. And that and that's what I believe is going on, in my point of view. And it comes from quite a bit of study about the sun. And... Mm-hmm. Well, do you, do you think the uh, sun is an organic being or a false construct? Oh, no, I think it's an organic being. I think it's a very, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's governed by um, different waves and things that come through space. But um, I think the whole entire universe is organic. I think the whole universe is intelligent. It's filled with intelligent life everywhere, and it's filled with a loving intelligence, and that it's governed sincerely uh, by uh, by a living intelligence that lives within everything in the universe. So, so recently we've noticed uh, the sun obviously going from yellow to white. What is that yep. trying to tell us? Being a, a sentient being. Um, well, I think it might be getting pissed off. Uh, no, I don't know. Um, it would be moving red if it was getting pissed. So <laughs> I would say it's, it's actually getting ascending. I mean, a yellow is a lower light and whiter is a higher light. So I would say it's it's ascending, and I think it's in some ways frying our consciousness. So you're seeing, you know, crack-ups going on everywhere you look and uh, you know, and I think that's a huge, huge thing because uh, it, w- it helps us understand, you know, what's going on. I, I do think that, you know, the sun and it's getting whiter uh, might have had some effect on, on, you know, climate and climate change, but I don't know if it's global warming. I think it's more... Um, I think it's more of a... a, a, a I don't know. I can't explain it. It's, it's it's changed the way that plants grow. I've noticed that, but I can't say any more than that. And I know animals are not. There's not as many animals as there used to be. That's all I can say. And that worries me to no end. I have to say, it's one of the things that you know. The high top twos of my worries is the disappearing animals, and and I'm worried about that because you know as the sun changes. Naturally, there will be changes in the, in the biological life here on Earth, including us, and we have to start thinking about that. But it is changing, and I've had conversations with people in NASA, and they've told me I'm right. So I have no doubt that you know the sun is changing right now, and they're worried about it. They don't know what to do about it. And the thing is, is that we don't really, you know, it was getting hotter and hotter, and then now suddenly it's gotten cold. Uh, the sun has gotten cold, the sunspots are disappearing, and the cli- uh, climate here is getting colder, uh, you know, just real suddenly. So it, we don't really know. Yeah, it's my understanding that we're heading into a mini ice age. But, yeah, you have to look around to all the other planets, and you notice that they're all going through dramatic climate changes. So uh, do you think what, what's going on out there? Is, is, is that a reflection of a larger incoming object that's perhaps influencing the weather and the climate change? No. I would say it's the sun. Something's going on with the sun. I don't think there's any incoming objects. Uh, if there is, that would be very worrisome. Um, uh, if there is a comet coming in, that would not change the, the planets. But the sun changing would change the planets. Um, I would be very worried about asteroids and comets. After examining the evidence that I've seen in the last two years uh, uh, about the hit of comets... Uh, in 13,000 years ago and the damage that it did to the planet, um, it has really uh, rocked my world. I mean it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, in, in January 2012, there was a whistleblower who was an outside consultant for NASA who was tracking three massive L-shaped crafts heading toward Earth. By January of 2013, they tracked these UFOs to about 200,000 miles past the planet Mars, which is when they instantaneously disappeared. About six months later, the objects reappeared and repositioned themselves behind the moon. Have you heard about this? And if so, why are they there? I I have heard about it. I've seen really good evidence of it. 
Um, I have no idea what they are. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff, go- I think, going on on the other side of the moon. I think that's why the moon always has a side that we never see. And, uh, you know, it's a large magician's trick. And uh, I think, you know, most of the um, beings that are controlling us, you know, are operating from that side of the moon. I know it sounds crazy. People think I'm crazy, but I've seen a lot of evidence to suggest that that's right. And um, I, But I don't know what they're doing. To be honest with you, I really don't. Except maybe not anything nice. Jay, are you still on the line with us? I think we've lost Jay. So let's give Jay just a moment here to call back in. I heard a. I thought I heard a click. Okay. You were really getting into that. (laughs) I know. And (laughs) I know people can't see this uh, right now, but I'm looking at. The uh, dashboard. We have a caller from area code one 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 one. I know that's that must be a Skype caller. Had a really good question lined up too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so far this has been a really kick-ass show, and uh, we can edit out, edit out all this stuff that's in here. But uh, what we're going to be talking about next is is creation. So uh, Missy, I could probably segue your question into this, um, but I'm curious about what Jay's thoughts are. So. Uh, Michelle's on online with him, and he's going to be calling right back. Hope everyone's enjoying the show so far. It's been really fascinating so far. It's been we're, we're 50 minutes into it, and uh, it's gone by really quickly. So um, this is fascinating. Hopefully, we're, we'll, we'll be able to uh, get Jay back on again sometime down the road. Yeah, I just talked to him, and he's going to call back in here. We're not sure what happened, so um, waiting for Jay to call back in. Uh, you know, um, I, I really enjoyed um, talking. I really wanted to hear what he had to say about the craft coming in, you know, across the sun and everything. So here he is. Welcome okay. back to the show, Jay. Sorry, I don't know hey. what happened, but... Uh, no, yeah. neither. Yeah. Probably the CIA. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, whatever Greg was talking about, you know, he was getting into this nice big... Um, talk about creation, whatever he was talking about, they kind of cut us off. But Greg, uh, go ahead and continue with your question. Okay. Well, all right. Let's get back to it. Yeah. Um, What I was curious about, it's obvious that the biblical story of all of us coming from Adam and Eve is utter bullshit, especially when you see four blood types and two different RH values. And my opinion is that it all boils down to three possibilities. Scenario one, Zechariah Sitchin's uh, scenario where he believes our DNA was manipulated by the Anunnaki. Um, scenario two, our planet was seeded here by various star families, which completely explains the differences in ethnicities, blood types, and RH values, while a third possibility exists of a combination of genetic manipulation along with the seeding of our planet by star nations. What are your thoughts on creation? Uh, good question. Um, well, let's see. Um, I, I spent a long time in you know, one part of my life in a, a Masonic, a person who had a, a very, very, very expensive library of uh, Masonic books. And I couldn't uh, really uh, take the books home. I could only go over to his house and read the books. And uh, <clears throat> what I gleaned from the whole thing Uh, My own creation story, gleaned from Masonic literature, and that may not be right, so don't, you know. (laughs) The only thing I would say about this literature was that it was extremely well thought out. It was not um, fly-by-night, and it was deep, and it wasn't just page. It was pages and pages, as if it was gleaned from some kind of ancient text, that uh, no longer existed, which is what I believe these books came from. Uh, Anyway, what they say is that we came from, is that Sirius, the, the star Sirius, was going from a regular sun, like our sun, to a, a red giant, and that it was going to consume the the planet that we originally came from. And so they built, what they did was they went out and they gathered up gigantic asteroids that were round. 
and they hollowed them out. And they, from what I understand, there were six of these that were constructed. And they had rocket propellers, and, and, and they shot them off, maybe using it in nuclear energy, uh, in every direction with a, a certain suns that were nearby uh, pinpointed. And the insides of these hollowed out worlds were um, where the people were that were from these, this planet that was about to be destroyed. And we know that Sirius was once a red giant because uh, uh, Owen Genrich of uh, Boston University has shown, you know, ancient uh, uh, astronomers of the past described Sirius as red, which is now white, which a red giant turns into a white dwarf, of course, which it is right now. And anyway, um, so I believe that one of those ships landed here, and um, it's the moon. And it, uh, uh, the moon is the ship that we took from Sirius. And the moon, uh, we um, we came down from the moon and create. We were the netters from Egypt, and we created man from a baboon uh, and Syrian uh, combination uh, and that this was the humans and because he couldn't really come here the, the, the problem was is that you know they didn't really have the immune system to actually live for extended periods of time here on earth uh, without a lot of protection so they created a hybrid that had an already adapted immune system, which then could live and subsist here. And so the first humans were created here, and they were for, probably as some kind of slaves or something. Who knows? I'm not sure what. Um, you know, I'm not. You know, they were, but they were created, and that these netters, you know, lived on the moon and 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 kind of directed humanity and came down here. Uh, for a long time, until for some reason they don't come here very much or they're not overt anymore. Anyway, take my creation story further, um, adopting from with Joseph Farrell and uh, uh, the text from India. The uh, humans here uh, that were now gifted with Syrian intelligence began uh, being uh, became very advanced and uh, began conquering other planets in the solar system. And they conquered Mars, the planet Mars, and they conquered, which they called Mahar, and then they conquered uh, the, the fifth planet. I'm not going to give it a name because everybody gets angry when I misname it because they're really, it's either Tiamat or it's, there's many mm -hmm. names for this fifth planet. Marduk, and they, yeah. Yeah, Marduk. And this planet was a planet with the big oceans, and it was between Mars and Saturn, and it um, it it was very. It turned out it was actually, in some ways, the most fertile of the three worlds that were conquered, and uh, uh, it had incredible uh, um, uh, oceans, and it was big, and 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 time went on, and different races because they were separated by the gulf of, of the distance, uh, it kind of emerged. So on the Earth, uh, the, the dominant race was a dark-skinned, uh, sub-Saharan African kind of race. And in um, on Mars, a, uh, a light-skinned, uh, blue-eyed kind of race emerged because of the iron oxide and things, and they were called the Aryans because Aryan means iron, and Mars is covered with iron oxide. And on the uh, other planet, uh, the fifth planet, you know, kind of an Asian type of people appeared. And I think that they, um, everything was fine, and then one day, a war, one day a war began between, I think, Earth and Marduk, uh, a vibrational weapon was created in which uh, literally Marduk was vibrated apart and exploded into a million pieces, which is now the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of uh, people escaped from Marduk, 
somehow. I'm not sure how. And uh, and Mars was blown apart, not blown apart, but one side of it was blown apart. And it lost its atmosphere and its magnetic field from this horrible thing. And they're all the refugees of this thing, the whites of Mars and the... Um, and the uh, uh, the uh, Asian type people of of Marduk came to the Earth as refugees, and we've been in kind of a holy war ever since. Ah, well, that that makes sense too. So there you go, folks. We have a uh, fourth possibility, and I'm sure there's probably thousands others. <laughs> yep. Uh, You know, I'd like to talk about archons for just a minute. I find it interesting that there are beings called archangels, and if you do the etymology of the word archangels, you basically get the word archon angelohim. Is there any relation between archons and archangels? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I ponder it frequently, and I wonder if, if, you know, the, uh, the archangels are not, you know, maybe some kind of manipulative being and that they attach the word ark onto the front of it so that we know that these are angels that we got to watch out for. I'm mm-hmm. saying that they're not, but I'm just saying that that's so what the etymology of the word archangel would suggest. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I worry about it and, and I kind of eschew uh, uh, that, that kind of... Um, uh, spirituality. I don't go after you know Archangel Michael and all that. Mm-hmm. I kind of don't go near it. I, you know, I stay over in the Indian side of things where I feel a little safer uh, mm-hmm. with the deities. Uh, not that I'm not. I, I find Jesus a, a, a perfectly okay deity because he was at war with the Archons. Uh, so you know, he. Uh, and I, I, but that story is covered up. They keep it hidden so you don't realize that the real story of Jesus was a, a rebellion against the archons. And so Jesus I'm, I'm perfectly okay with, but archangels and uh, things like that, Mary I'm okay with, but you know, the rest of it I'm not, you know, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the whole Jesus thing, and here we are approaching Christmas. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've delved into that quite extensively, and from my research, there was no Jesus. It was a creation of the Council of Nicaea when they gathered together to uh, bring together all of the Yeshua uh, cults together under one common name. Which the, they uh, there was actually a Yeshua ben Yosef who lived approximately a hundred years beforehand. Uh, he and his wife Mary Magdalene and their daughter moved to uh, France after um, you know being in disagreement with the uh, the, the, the Hebrew uh, government. And uh, because it was so long afterwards, there was really no way of proving, you know, th- that this guy ever existed. But they did base their cult on uh, Yeshua ben Yosef. And when they met at the Council of Nicaea, they decided on one common name, and the name was Jesus Christos, which they ended up saying Jesus Christ. And uh, to me, I-, I honestly don't believe that Jesus ever existed. And you know, I know that there are many people who do, but uh, to me, I'm I'm. I'm not buying it. It's one of those conspiracies that is almost impossible to to prove, but that's where my gut's really pulling um, me right I, now. I tend to agree, I tend to agree with you. I th- I think that it was a um, like a combination of different historical characters that were thrown together. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it'd be like putting John F. Kennedy and John Lennon and John. <laughs> You know, putting them together and mixing it all up. Oh, there was this rock star who was the president, you know, and he wrote a song called Imagine. And then he said, do not, you know, do what your country do for you. You know, this whole kind of (laughs) mishmash of history. That's kind of what I think. Oh, there's this rebellion. There was a guy who actually came into the temple and discovered that it was really a bank and then overthrew the money changers. I believe that story. Okay. Mm -hmm. I actually believe it. I yeah. believe that actually happened. I, I believe that too. He was a rebel. Yeah. You know? yeah, and then he got killed for that, right, mm-hmm. by the bankers. Totally yes. believe it, right? He got crucified. <laughs> yeah, it's today. Got it. That happened <laughs> for sure. Suicides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, we look at this and we see that, you know, but, but changing, you know, fishes and stuff, loaves into fishes, yeah. you know, this is where it gets kind of dicey. And, and, yeah. and you know, so... Um, well, that's all no, I, you know, the, the, to announce the age of 
uh, Pisces when he did the bread and the two fish. Yeah, that's what it know? was all about, right? That the whole thing was a mishmash of myths about the coming of the age of Pisces and the sun, you know, him being the sun inside the um, twelve signs or the twelve apostles. You know, it's yes. just it's all this that's kind of being separated by threes. Uh, each representing each three uh, within the Last Supper being. Like different the change of seasons and yeah. But also, um, and interestingly enough, is the secret of alchemy um, kind of wrapped up in that story, where uh, you know the the um, uh, uh, Jesus being also a synonym for fire, and Mary being a synonym for water, and uh, the cross being the crux of the crucible where the um, spirit uh, takes three days to transform and then is thrown into a cave where he is resurrected, i.e. ascended. Now, that is very interesting and uh, has a lot of uh, spiritual and alchemical credibility. So you see, again, that's this is such a mishmash of like 50 different angles on different stories and headlines and things that you realize it was a movement that had all of these things in it, right? Imagine a movement that worshipped John F. Kennedy, John Lennon, the song Imagine, the Beatles, Mm -hmm. right? And then later on, all got mixed in. There was one guy who did it all. Right, instead of all these different guys that were doing it, and I think that's what it was. Now, Jay, um, you suggest that the book of Aquarius about alchemy um, is, you know, a way to create the philosopher's stone. And I was just wondering, um, I listened to an interview back in 2012 that you had with Kerry Cassidy, where. You said that you were developing the Philosopher's Stone. I was wondering how that's going for you, and um, do you use urine to do that? Well, now. <laughs> hmm. Get a little personal, aren't you? <laughs> well, um, you know, that book, by the way, is available in, on N5D in an article called J. Widener, Alchemy and the Golden Age. So if you're wondering, if the listeners out there are wondering what I'm talking about, you can check that out. Well, I've had a complete rethink uh, via uh, many, many experiments, discussions, much money spent on the entire thing. And um, how do I say this so it doesn't sound like a big letdown? Um, The secret the secret one one the secret of alchemy is very is varied but i can tell you that there's one secret that is actually quite open um if you think about it and the literature is quite there if you think about it and the book of aquarius t- touched on it and and had all and if and if you read the literature from the ancients that the author of the book of Aquarius uh, chronicled in that book, then you will see that what I'm about to say is right, but he got it wrong. And he had the he had his bibliographies right, but his conclusions were wrong. And I think he knows mm-hmm. that because he's pulled the book from the web. So what I'm saying is, is that... Um, what one of the things that one of the main things that humans do that causes uh us to age which causes our body to gain weight and to become heavy literally heavy and which causes our electromagnetic field our etheric body our higher self to dampen as we get older, is that we're consuming, um, well, we're consuming way too many toxins, but what we're really doing is, through our water, we're consuming way, way, way too many minerals. And these minerals that you think are good for you are not. And what they're Mm -hmm. doing is they're coating your heart, they're coating your inside of your brain vessels, 
They're coating your arteries, everything with rock. <clears throat> and it's very dangerous. It's called hardening of the arteries, and it's called heart attacks. It's called dementia, and it's, uh, it coats the pineal gland. And it's the worst single thing that happens in our world. And there's almost nothing you can do about it. I said mm-hmm. almost nothing. So ancient man, somewhere along the line, realized this. Realized that this constant coating of minerals in the in your body, maybe they did autopsies and saw the hardening of the arteries and the inside of the heart completely covered with it. By the way, the number one cause of death in the world is heart attacks, which is mm-hmm. caused by the closing of the aorta. Right? And, and some right. dilation of the aorta due to plaque. Is what they call this rock, right? So doctors call this rock plaque, right? It's on your teeth. It's everywhere, all right? So um, somewhere along the line, someone in ancient history realized that this problem. And they said, okay, so what, how, what, what can you do to not have this? And they looked into it, and they realized that there's really only three ways to get water that doesn't have uh, minerals in it. One, and, and remember, this is back before electricity, and, and it was hard to, to generate. It was even hard to boil water at this point. But I'm talking a long time ago. They realized that there was only three ways that you could gather water that did not have these heavy minerals in it. One, was to collect dew or rainwater, preferably dew because it has less minerals than rainwater. Um, two uh, was to uh, distill it. They discovered that there was a way that you could boil water and create the kind of tubing and things necessary to extract the water and leave the minerals behind. Um, that was to call distilling. And then three was that your own body distilled water. Uh, through the kidneys, and that urine was essentially distilled water, and that if you drank enough water uh, through your body, you would create a clear water that came out the other end that um, had memory. Uh, if you know the work of uh, um, Emoto, the great, uh, who just recently died, by the way, a uh, Japanese scientist working on water, then you know that water has memory. And so when you drink your urine, and everybody's going, ah, um, uh, you are <laughs> drinking water that has a memory of yourself, of your insides. Mm-hmm. It knows that your kidneys need help. It knows that your liver's stressed out. It knows that your lungs, maybe you're breathing too much pollution. Okay? And, and it sends this distilled water into those areas. Okay. So. What does distilled water do? Distilled water removes minerals from your system. Distilled water runs down through your veins and it scours them of the rock and crystal, the plaque that grows everywhere. And, and, and so this then became one of the secrets of alchemy was that drinking distilled water and doing uh, would remove the plaque from your system and uh and that would make your body more supple uh and a lot of people are freaking out because they're on the internet right now and they're reading that um actually it uh, strips your body of minerals and that makes you anemic and you'll die and I, I'm here to say, no, that's not true. I'm not usually talk about distilled water, but you asked. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that if you wake up every day and you have a drink that has maca powder in it and fish oils and uh, green, uh, uh, powdered greens, and and you really pile it on and, and, you, and, and you drink your, that drink every day and you eat really well during the day, lots of greens and <clears throat> alkaline foods, um, nothing will happen to you uh, with 
uh, distilled water, except that you will start looking better, um, thinking more clearly. Your pineal gland will decalcify. Your arteries will start losing all of the minerals. Your blood, which means your blood will now flow more freely, which means your uh, neurons will start firing more clearly. And uh, it's the greatest thing on earth, but, you know, um, the modern world is is stacked up against uh, me on this. So I don't usually talk about it because I don't want someone to sue me. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm in the same boat as you, and I was doing the distilled water for, gosh, almost a year. And I switched over to um, ozone water. I have this huge um, five-gallon jug of Zephyr Hills water, which is spring water, and I have an ozone machine right above it, and I add ozone to it. And what I do is I put it into a sigil glass that I, uh, of a sigil that I made. So I'm actually trying to use sigils for the betterment of humanity. And I, I put the intention in there that it's opening up my pineal gland and that all my codons are open so I can fully you know, use them to help humanity. And I, I, I put that intention into the water, and I drink that. And I'll tell you what, you know, my, my hair has turned from mostly gray to its original color. And um, I'm seeing all sorts of other benefits, you know, health-wise that are included with it. And if you do a research on ozone, the benefits of ozone, and I just posted the, uh, a couple links in our chat room here for the uh, listeners there, um, there there's, there's hundreds of benefits of ozone. So I'm trying to combine both ozone, uh, the, uh, the, the intentions, and uh, the power of sigils into uh, creating something. And you know, I'm just kind of going out on a limb <laughs> And uh, just trying something different that no one else is trying. Hey, why not? You know. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, another interesting thing about all this is uh, nano water, and this is the whole idea of, uh, and this is where another place where I think this kind of urine alchemy came in uh, in the old days, and this is the idea that. Uh, um, because of toxicity in the water supply right now, and not even distillation can get rid of what you call what we call glob, globular. I'm not going to be able to pronounce this. Where water begins to cluster, um, a, a globular cluster, I think is the word I'm trying to say, and uh, uh, where water begins, the molecules begin clustering or sticking together, and you can't get them separated. And this doesn't sound very uh, bad, but what it, it but it actually it is bad because um, uh, what it, that this means is that the cell wall uh, that when you drink the water the cell wall in your cells is is smaller than the cluster, so you can't get any moisture into your cells, and so now there's a whole new uh, kind of research going on is is alchemy you know, really about nanoing the clustered water so that it can become small rivulets or vortexes which uh, enter into the tiny holes in the cell and can uh, hydrate it because the biggest problem that we face, aging, all of this is caused by dehydration, all of it. I guarantee it. Wrinkles, gray hair, everything is, is caused by dehydration and you know no matter how much water you drink you can't rehydrate and that means that there's something wrong with the water itself and that's what we have to look at i agree i'm sitting here tonight drinking real alkalized water which has supposedly has an alkaline value of 8.0 ph and you know dr leonard yeah, well, yeah, we're trying it. I mean, we're trying everything out, and, you know, we thought, you know, if we see some major improvements on one thing or the other, we're kind of guinea pigs for each other. And, you know, Dr. Mm-hmm. Leonard Caldwell says that cancer cannot grow in an alkaline um, uh, environment, in a, an acidic, is it acidic environment, Greg? Yeah, and yeah, an acidic yeah. environment. So you raise your alkaline, your pH level through eating, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. Cancer. Oh and, yeah, if yeah. you know, if you know someone who's overweight, um, you know, even a little bit overweight, just say, hey, dude, you know, start drinking this green drink and get that natural green or uh, kamut, and just say every day, you know, just pour yourself with alkaline, and you won't even have to worry about anything else. You'll start losing weight, and you will. Mm. Yeah, uh, well, 
I, you know, I really love bread. That's when that's bread and potatoes are my very yeah, favorite. Yeah, that's my weakness. No pasta is mine on this planet. Yeah, yeah and pasta well, too. So I have tried that, and it does work. And you know, it, my body tells me right now that I need bread. So uh, that I need potatoes. I, I ground myself with potatoes. Otherwise, I could be really high out there. So um, I'm trying to alkalize water. But Jay, um, you know, we're about. Um, we're getting close to the end of the show because I know that you that you have to go tonight, but I wanted to uh, give you the opportunity to talk about trauma-based mind control, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I think that's a well, topic that you wanted to bring up. Well, yeah, I don't know. How, how long do we have? As, as long, long as, as you want. want. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of my head, Greg Prescott. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll go till the top of the hour, I guess. Um, Yay! Yay! All right, so I, I wanted to talk about this because I've been doing a lot of research into uh, trauma-based mind control and how um, your mind is bent and formed by traumatic events and, uh, you know, how uh, movies and uh, are designed to create trauma so that you identify with certain characters and then if you're young, which is really the important part here, you want to go out and buy toys and um, all the ancillary items that are identified with that film to identify with the being that you identified with as a young person who was being traumatized in the movie, um, whether it be Luke Skywalker or whoever, right, an animated character or whatever. And um, and, and so I, real, I began to realize that we were... We, at first, it was discovered through movies that you could traumatize the audience, i.e. children mostly, in young people's films, to identify with the character, then start buying toys and everything associated with this. And uh, later in life, you could actually use that kind of programming um, to change that person's behavior by using things that were closely identified with the original trauma-based mind control. That sent me kind of reeling because that means that this was starting at least in the 70s when the uh, movies were becoming uh, based on toys and ancillary objects. Uh, uh, so I realized that at that point some kind of nefarious group must have infiltrated Hollywood and was starting to use it in movies to sell products. Wouldn't that actually go earlier between the two, like uh, Cowboys and Indians and G.I. Joe action figures? Well, that was actually more in the 70s. The early 70s okay. was when, not the Cowboys okay. and Indians, but G.I. Joe was when it really... Yeah. Here, but there was no movie of G.I. Joe. That's okay. true. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it wasn't okay. really until actually around Star Wars where you began having these kinds of mm -hmm. E.T., where you began having these kinds of reciprocal marketing campaigns where you were identifying with whoever the trauma-based victim in the movie was. And gotcha. you were buying, you were identifying him, going home and going, oh, my God, I'm just like that person, you know, because you're in drama. And then you go out and uh, and you identify them via buying of products. And mm -hmm. this this became very interesting to me as as I began looking at it. And, and, and now I'm kind of realizing that they kind of took it worldwide in 9-11, where the trauma based was now going to be real, even though it wasn't. I'm not saying that people didn't die. I'm just saying that what the story was that we were told is not the story that really happened. And, and, and then a series of events after that began occurring, each one becoming in some ways more, um, hmm, uh, uh, disturbing and in some ways more amateurish so that we could see through it more easily um, and uh, for us that could see. But for those that can't see, the effect was completely traumatic and uh, uh, to the point where there were people that didn't want their children to go to school anymore. Uh, they had 
conceal and carry weapons with them to protect their children when they're brought, dropping them off at school. I mean, the amount of stories that have occurred since Sandy Hook and the Boston bombings is amazing. And they've caused this trauma to spread across the United States. And, um, and I'm watching us become more mentally ill. And, and it's deeply concerning me because I'm worried about what's going on and what I see right now, and I realize it's a direct result of these crazy events that are going out of convinced people that you know that they can't go to the movie theater because a madman's going to jump out of nowhere and start shooting a machine gun at them, and that they can't send their kids to school because and and all these things are going on, and I can see that what it is is that we are suffering under a kind of global trauma-based mind control. And we have to recognize it, and we have to recognize it soon. So thanks for, you know, going into that. And we see that, you know, that's part of the programming, part of the archonic programming. And um, I was just wondering, there was another topic that you wanted to touch on. You had talked about the um twice now you talked you brought up the sandy hook and i think most of our listeners realize you know how that was orchestrated um mm-hmm. but i was just wondering if you had anything else that you wanted to talk about uh, you had mentioned re- recent fake terrors so if, well, you know, I mean, is there anything there, there, else no not really i mean i'm I, i've reached you know the end but uh you know i just want people to understand that you know these things are going on and that uh, uh, we have to become hyper aware of it because this is the plan: is to use these theatrical events to control us, and we have to understand that and to rebel against it. I think, fortunately, right now, whenever something like that happens, the first thing most people think now, false flag. And I love seeing Good. that. Yeah, Me I too. love. Well, I don't love seeing the false flag, but the, the the thought process: Why did this happen? Or is this smoke and mirrors? What's happening over on the right that's detracting us from what's happening on the left? Yeah, I mean, and they have a hundred thousand researchers jumping right in now in a free for all, and they 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 don't know this was not expected, and they did not do not know what to do with it, and uh, um, they're going to have to figure out a way to shut down all these private sites where people are exchanging information. But I, I, I look at it and I understand programming. I'm very good at programming. and I don't know how they're going to be able to shut it down. Well, you know, Jay, there is one last question. I, I, I did – actually, I have a couple more, if you don't mind. But um, one of the things I was, I was wondering about, Alfred Weber talks about humanity finally being on a positive time timeline. Are you aware of any positive timelines that swing in humanity's favor? in the near future? Uh, well, that's why I created The Last Avatar. I'm trying to change the timeline to a positive nice. timeline and to um, you know use everything we can through the media that was created uh, by them to overcome what they're doing. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a you know, wrench thrown into the cogwheels of their machine. And I, I'm not saying it's going to change anything, but I think that it, the whole kind of philosophy behind the creation of the movie was that if we can explain our side, you know, clearly and articulately, but by using their media, high quality media, then Mm -hmm. we can accomplish something that is beyond just saying it. And so that was a whole attempt. And that's why, you know, it took five years to make the film because I kept trying to make it so that it was right, and it didn't matter to me how much it cost. <laughs> well, you know, I um, I I love the um the movie or the film Room Two Three Seven that you did. I was able to oh yeah to see that, and you know, you you really studied um, Stanley Kubrick, who um did the film uh, The Shining, um. And what he did is he took that movie or he took that script of The Shining and he made it into what we, what you've concluded and what many others have concluded and you just reported on, that he was uh, basically confessing that the moon landing, uh, the one that we saw, 
was basically faked, and he was using all kinds of symbolism, and he actually studied how the Illuminati uses um, hidden symbols and black magic on television and on advertising so he could be able to insert these things into the movie. And, you know, he was uh, he was an expert and, and mastermind at this. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that uh, I didn't want to, you know, end the show without talking to you about. If, you, if there's uh, something that you'd like to discuss about um, Kubrick or, um, you know, any of the other uh, films that you've done, and I know that they can go on your website, um, sacredmysteries.com, is that correct, to, to look at all the different yep. films that you've done. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, um, yeah, you can see my film uh, Kubrick's Odyssey or Kubrick's Odyssey 2, and soon will be Kubrick's Odyssey 3, which I'm working on right now, which is going to be the big blowout expose of the whole thing, and that can be done with my Stanley Kubrick work. Uh, forever, thank God. And um, but it's going to be great. It's got um, lots of things that are going to be really surprising, uh, and uh, it's going to blow a hole in the side of a lot of things that people hold sacred. Uh, but I don't want to say too much about it because I'm working on it right now. But uh, and it gets better and better. In other words, I keep going deeper and deeper into the whole saga uh, of Stanley and what he was really about and what he was trying to tell us. And he was really, you know, a good guy. And, yeah, The Shining is all about... Shining is a multifaceted story of uh, of intrigue. Uh, and, and, you know, it was, it was really a film of a guy who was bored. Uh, and so, you know, he he'd done everything, and he didn't really know where to go. And he found this book and he you know, uh, by Stephen King, and... And he decided that he was going to throw all this other research that he'd been doing, including the expose on the moon landing, but also subliminal seduction and all the other things that he was looking at, and throw them all into this movie. And um, and this movie, I think Room 237 is only the beginning. I think there's probably <laughs> you know another two-hour movie that could be made about that movie. Yeah. Well, I found it uh I found it fascinating and um I was you know, I had watched The Shining before, but I was even looking around um just from your room 237 from the still shots that you had and stuff and even the like the wallpaper uh border up on some of the columns had Z's on them, you know, uh depicting, you know, humanity being asleep. And just there were so many other things that the every little, little boy with the Apollo uh, rocket on his shirt. On his, sh- on his sweatshirt, yeah. So basically, yep. you know, um, the whole premise was that um, what we saw on television was not our mission <laughs> to to the moon. And I know that you had said before that that doesn't mean that we may not have gone to the moon, but, but what was on the moon uh, we didn't get to see. So, um, you know, there's all all of these other people like Laura Magdalene Eisenhower who has um, t- told us that there's a mission um, where they have jump rooms to Mars. There's, there are colonies, civilizations on Mars. All of these things are being revealed to us to um, slowly to show those who want to hear and who are questioning um, that there's a lot more than we even realize is going on. Well, no, that's for sure. Uh, and and, <laughs> yep. I, and I've, I've had many uh, email uh, conversations with Laura. And, uh, yeah, there's, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> it's unbelievable, actually. And the more you look, you know, the more you, there should be one site that has, you know, all of this stuff put together it's so funny. that we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know because it's so amazing, and the world is so much bigger than we think it is, and mm. and uh, you know people like Stanley were trying to tell us, and and other people like Joseph Skipper on MarsAnomalyResearch dot com, you know he's showing us a lot of the weird anomalies on Mars, and and it's getting weirder. Who knows what that thing is doing on that comet, that uh, that thing that landed? You know, is it really yeah. dead? You know, you know, so we don't know any of this. 
And uh, I think it's much weirder than we can ever, ever conceive. And I think there's a secret space program and research that's way above what we're being told. And we're never going to find out uh, unless we have some kind of, uh, you know, storm the barricades kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I know that you are, have always had something in the works, but I was just wondering from uh, for those of us who research things in order to gain a sense of knowledge, you know, of our existence and where we're moving. We're always uncovering new ideas every day. And I was wondering if you could give us just a little glimpse, though, of what you've learned since uh, writing your last book or doing your last feature film. You know, if there's if there anything else earth-shaking that you'd like to share with our audience tonight. Oh, well, uh, let's see. You know, the... Uh earth shaking maybe not maybe more like uh you're far more in control of your, your universe than you think you are and that your mind is far more powerful than you ever could ever conceive that it is and that you, the reason that you're being lied to and showered with bs everywhere is because they don't want you to uncover the secret and that once you uncover the secret that you are actually an extremely powerful being and that your mind is much more powerful than you think it is, then you become the master of the universe instead of them being the master of you. And that's, you know, I, I, and I know that people say, well, well I'd prove that to me. And I can't. I can't prove it to you. You can only do it to yourself. You know, it's through, it's through practices and meditations and and clearing and uh, distilled water and maybe ozone water and who knows nano water and and trying mm-hmm. to um, keep yourself in a purified state and and to understand and be clear about the world that you can uncover you know your Jedi powers or whatever you want to call them and and when you have that then you can articulate a vision which. Uh, other people will understand and then they will begin um, also um, gravitating towards and then slowly we change a consciousness and, uh, and, and the problem is is that we're at the stage right now in history where we cannot slowly change the consciousness we have to actually quicken it and really get it going and 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 waken everyone all at once, and I'm not sure how we do that. You know, that's the theme of my film, The Last Avatar, and you know, but how do we do this on a, on a global scale, and to wake everyone up? But I will tell you that it is happening. I don't know how mm-hmm. fast it's happening, but it is happening. I'm old enough to know that uh, it is happening. That I I think see and things that are going on around me and hear things that are going on around me that I never would have dreamed or would have heard or seen 10 years ago. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure in five years it's going to be, you know, an, another leap of this. So I'm, you know, I'm really a, an optimist who, uh, you know, unfortunately prepares for the uh, pessimist and, <laughs> um, and, and just tr- tries to keep track that we're all beings of light and that we're not going to, there's no such thing as death, and mm-hmm. everything we've been told is such a, a pile of uh, BS that, you know, it's time to just get the shovel out and start getting rid of it, you know, throwing it somewhere else because we don't need it anymore. And slowly, I think, this kind of mindset will overtake the planet. Well, I agree, and I've always um, been you know, very clear on all of my shows that it it is my opinion and I feel like that this is happening one person at a time. And, you know, you mentioned Dr. Emoto earlier, and I believe that our bodies are mostly made up of water. And those of us who came here to hold this high vibration and to bring more of our consciousness into our body to raise our vibration, we do that so we can affect everyone around us and everyone on the planet, and we can intentionally send that vibration into every living being on the planet, and that is how we are going to quicken. It, it's an inside job. It's like we're undercover CIA agents of our own coming here as light warriors to change the consciousness of the planet. And I, 
we do see that it is happening and we do see that there are more people waking up every day because we see the numbers on N5D of people who are searching for information. And when I began my awakening process five years ago, I wished I had known about N5D. So I appreciate people like you coming on our show and sharing you know, confirmation with what we're doing here because um, we're trying to reach as many people as possible and we definitely want to support you in your film. And I just love the Mount Shasta area. It has this magic, mysterious quality about it. And I know that using film like you did in such a creative manner is such such an easy way to do some kind of maybe, I'm going to call it white magic programming instead of black magic programming because we do know that the brain can be programmed. And so why not use, like you said, the Hollywood tool for you know, a positive effect. And I hope that we can do that with television one day. And uh, I know that that uh, all these people that um, when one person wakes up and it just hits like wildfire, and I know that we're going to make it, I hope it's in our lifetime. Are you sure? And if And if not... Um, I do know that when we pass over, we'll either get a chance to quickly reincarnate again or we can handle it from the other side as a guide. So if, if I totally any agree of us, with what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, if any of us, uh, you know, pass, you know to be looking for us because we're going to be here right along with humanity. So, Jay. Yeah, that's um, a really I good point. You. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you yeah, very I much. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's been fun, right. and uh, you, you are absolutely right. And, and and as we, and if you do pass over, give us some help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jay, thank you so much for being our guest tonight, and I'll be in touch with you on how I can yeah. help you promote yeah, your new we movie. Need, the need all the time. help we can, and everybody listening, we need all the help we can. You know, we, we this is uh, as the, the subline of the movie is this is a revolution of the spirit. So any help you can give to this revolution would be really, really appreciated. Well, We'd love and so to promote how it. do they how do they view that? Do they go on which website go do they to, go on? They go to the the last avatar movie dot com, and you can become a person who can show the movie. You know, see the oh, movie. Cool. Look at the trailer, all of that. We could do that, Greg. We could hold sure. um, we could hold a local, um, a local thing here in Sarasota, Florida, because I know we've got a that lot. That would of people be perfect. A lot of people so, in Sarasota. And, yes, Sarasota well, is also, a hot spot. Uh, it is. It's a, it's a mer- metaphysical hot spot. It really I can is. also put some ads on uh, both of my websites to draw people. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. We support you, Jay. Thank you so Jay, much for being on the so show. Thank you so much. Okay, and thanks, thanks for guys for the support. And have a good Bye. Yeah, have thank a good you. Day. And thanks for the overtime. <laughs> so, all right. So, thanks for um for tuning in to the N5D Radio's Cosmic Awakening show tonight. And I just wanted to remind those of you who are listening to the show live and for those of you who are listening to the recording that um, I'm a certified holistic life coach, and that's where I can help people see the bigger picture. And you can find out more about that on my website, which is www.michellewalling.com. And I also have uh, another website where I post all of my articles and uh, my radio shows. I I do a lot of other radio shows with other people, too, and you can, uh, like, uh, as a guest, and you can find those on cosmicstarseeds.com. And in my spare time, I also have another radio show called BMSS Radio that stands for Body, Mind, Soul, Spirit, where I discuss the topics um, on that website on Blog Talk Radio every now and then on Sundays when I feel like it. I just bring bring people on that one as well. You know, it's all about bringing um, all different, what people see as different levels of people um, on our show. But, you know, we are all one and we are all equal so I like to give everybody a chance to have a platform to reach out to those of us who are awakening and give them the opportunity to connect. And uh, stay tuned, of course, to N5D.com for the latest information about the Cosmic Awakening Show. And subscribe to uh, BodyMindSoulSpirit.com up in the top right-hand corner, and you can get all of the great articles that we um, post on Body, Mind, Soul, Spirit in your email inbox. And I just want to give a special thanks tonight to Greg um, for hosting the show with me, sweetheart. 
I appreciate it very much. It's very um it's it's um it's a wonderful thing based on your um on your readings that you've had from Lavendar and from uh who's the gal up there in in the UK um that we love so much. She's Sean having Cohen. Sean Cohen, she's having a show, a special show um for a Christmas celebration or a holiday celebration where she's giving free readings, so you might want to check out Sean Cohen's website. Um, we are always looking for people who want to join us in writing articles to publish on N5D and BMSS. Uh, Greg, can you tell our listeners where they can submit their material to be reviewed? Yeah, actually the best way to get a hold of me would be probably just to, uh, to admin, A-D-M-I-N, at N5D.com. And uh, just put in the in the title, article submission, and... Uh, you know, it, I'll, I'll read it over. I read every one of them. And if it's in 5D material, it'll definitely get up there and you'll be able to reach a lot of people and help them. And the easiest way for, for you to submit something is if you are a blogger and you have a website, just give us the link to the post that you'd like to submit. And if you are going to write it out, we prefer that you use a non-formatted uh, Word document where you just pull it up and just start typing, and that will give us the opportunity to cut and paste it into um, the format that we use. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit real quick as we finish up about some upcoming announcements for the show. Uh, next week's show falls on Christmas Day. So I may or may not have a show. I, I was thinking about, well, I know I'm not going to have a live show on Christmas Day, um, and it's not because... <laughs> we uh, are, are celebrating Christmas, you know, based on our Saturnalia talk tonight. Um, but we may do a recorded show this week. We're just Greg and I are just going to see how it goes and and see if we have enough time. Where we're, where we have a lot of work on our plate, but we may do a recorded show. But if you don't hear from us, I did want to say that on January first, which is New Year's Day we will get right back into some cosmic awareness with ET contactee Simon Parks at a special time, which will be 2 p.m. Eastern due to the time difference with Simon and in the U.K. And then on January 8th, we will have the awesome astrologer Carl Boudreaux. On January 15th, we will have Brad Johnson, who channels Adronis. And on January 22nd will be Alfred Labramont Weber. On January 29th, we will have the one known as Lily, who was first introduced by Lisa Harrison and Brian Kelly. And I will be introducing my friend uh, Jeff Gates, who will be my guest co-host for that show. And finally, I'm going to be bringing back Pleiadian Julian Wells on February 5th. So we have a cosmic packed lineup for those of you who are into gathering as much information as you can to discover who you are and why you are here. So with that being said, keep looking up to the sky and stay centered and focused in your heart. I want to send love out to all of our listeners out there live and on the recording. Good evening. Namaste, everyone, and uh, goodbye. Thank you for having us. It was a wonderful interview. Mm-hmm.